Our scripture lesson of this is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, and it's verses 1 to 10. And it can be found on pages 1057 in your pew Bibles if you would like to follow along. Listen to the word of God. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and at three in the afternoon, now a man crippled from birth, being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who had used to sit begging at the temple gate, beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. This is the word of God. Episode six in the continuing saga from Dr. Luke. Let's pray together. God, grant that what, uh, what goes on in these next uh, few minutes will be um, stuff you're willing to use to challenge us, to move us to obedience, that in um, responding appropriately to the call of your word, our lives will bear witness to the truth in it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Acts chapter 2 ended, you'll remember, with, uh, with a brief description of the infant church in Jerusalem in which there was fellowship and teaching and sharing and praising God and remarkable growth all going on simultaneously. Luke also noted in that, at the end of chapter 2, that, uh, quote, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. For example, here, right at the beginning of chapter 3, uh, Luke recounts for us an incident that attracted a good deal of public attention. One afternoon, Peter and John were on their way to the temple for afternoon prayer. Obviously, the followers of Jesus still practiced the disciplines of Orthodox Judaism, uh, why not? They were Orthodox Jews. Uh, just another day of praising God, right? Well, not exactly. At verse 2, Luke introduces a new character into our drama. Actually, there was nothing all that unusual about the man. Uh, it's true he was a crippled beggar, but then, come on, you can find disabled people looking for a handout on the streets of almost any city in the world, right? Right? I'm sure that that was just as true uh, then as it is today. It's an interesting sidelight to me that Dr. Luke reveals his medical training here in taking time to note that this particular man had a congen congenital deformity, uh, and later on he's going to detail the precise nature of his healing. But what I want you to notice here is the deliberate way in which the crippled man positioned himself near the temple gate, which had been given the nickname Beautiful, the Eastern Gate. Why would he do that? I'll tell you why, because he was a good salesman. That's why. He knew exactly how to market his condition for optimum effect. Somebody once asked J.C. Penney the key to his success in business. And his response was, success in retailing is 90% location. The other 10% is location. 
I'm sure this beggar knew that by setting up shop right next to the elaborately decorated beautiful gate, the splendor and the opulence of that setting would only accentuate his poverty. What's more, he knew that people on their way to worship are more likely to be generous. He was also aware that people who are in a hurry uh, to get wherever they're going, who are on their way to an appointment, are less likely to argue or make a fuss. It's easier to give him a handout and just be done with it. That man was simply doing his job. And he was probably doing it very well, I might add. And then at verse 3 it says, When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. I mean, this man could spot an easy mark from a mile away. I mean, it, it, uh, he had a, a precision radar born of years of training. Uh, what he was about to get, however, was far from what he bargained for. He asked them for money, and he asked them for it, I suspect, in a way that was practiced and polished to a dull sheen. He knew exactly how to hook them, or so he thought. You notice in verse 4 the unexpected way in which Peter and John responded. Luke says that Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. Interesting, right? Uh, yeah, those of you who are parents know exactly, almost intuitively from practice, exactly what those guys are doing there. There are times when our children give us the distinct impression that they have acute hearing loss, just like that. And what do you do when you want to get their attention? You say to your kid, look at me, look, come on. Look, at, look in these eyes. I want to make sure that what I'm about to tell you registers, right? And they, uh, they, they, that's exactly what Peter does here. It, it would have been so easy for Peter uh, to have given this man a few shekels without even looking at him. But he didn't do that. It's to Peter and John's credit and to our benefit that Luke records what they did do. First, they took time to look at the man and discern the need behind the request. But then... Peter took it a step further and said to the man, look at us. That is to say, look at me, I am not an ATM. Okay. You don't push the button and expect an automatic handout. It doesn't work that way with me. If you expect to get something from us, then what we're talking about here is a, a different kind of transaction altogether. So. Strap on your seatbelt. Luke writes at verse 5, So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Okay. He'd ask for a handout. What did he expect to get from them? Duh. Money, right? Let's stop for just a minute and let that one verse... Uh, act as a kind of little parable on the practice of prayer. The man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Look, we're all needy people when it comes to prayer, right? And I dare say that for most of us, when we bring our petitions to God, we're likely to say something like, please, Lord, I need this or that. Or if we're interceding for others, we'll say, please, Lord, do such and such for so and so, right? And wh when we do that, what is it that we expect to get from God? Unless I miss my guess, we generally expect, to give God, expect God to give us what we ask for, right? Or at least to deal with us in terms of, of what we're hoping for. Often, I suspect, it never even enters our mind. It certainly doesn't enter my mind very often when I pray, when I'm asking God for stuff. And I question whether or not it enters most of our minds when we're asking God that God might be ready to give us something, but it's something significantly different from what it is that we're asking for, something infinitely better, something more appropriate, but not necessarily what we ask for. 
And I wonder how often we miss the blessings that God has already extended to us in response to our needs, and we miss them because they didn't meet our expectations. We didn't get what we thought we were asking for. The beggar asked for a handout. He expected a handout. And that, to me, is what makes Peter's response all the more memorable. Silver or gold I do not have, he said, but what I have, I give you. Peter was moved to act, not only from pity for the man's obvious need, but out of a heartfelt compulsion to meet that man's deeper need. It was Christ's love for this man. This, the same Holy Spirit that moves us to see others with Jesus' eyes is the same Holy Spirit who moved Peter and John to see in that man not just another unfortunate beggar, but the man that God had created him to be, the man that the Lord longed for him to be. And with that inspired vision, they dared to act. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Peter said, walk. And the man jumped to his feet, right? Nope, not, that's not what it says. Look again at verse 7. It reminds us of a marvelous truth. Luke says, taking him by the right hand, Peter helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Don't miss the obvious, profound lesson here. Peter held out his right hand to that man. This is the same massive right arm that had been spending years and years hauling in those fish nets out of the Sea of Galilee. And I sometimes wonder, as he wrapped his fingers around that man's wrist and pulled him to his feet, I wonder if it didn't flash through his mind the memory of Jesus saying to him, Peter, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And here Peter is hauling in his first catch. But you notice Peter had to extend himself to make that connection. He'd offered the man the healing grace of Jesus Christ, but then he had coupled it with the offering of his own personal strength. And those two resources, extended together, spelled out a miracle. They still do. In a, a graphic way, this encounter also spells out the work of the Church of Jesus Christ Universal and the work of this church in particular. And for that work, we, like this disciples, need five things at, at a minimum. Compassion, discernment, integrity, boldness, and generosity. Like Peter and John, we need compassion. Compassion to hear the cries of the world around us, to hear not only the hungry and the disabled who are always seem to be asking for food or for a helping hand, but we also need to hear the cries of those who are out of work or without adequate shelter. The cry of the single parent who is near exhaustion because they're trying to hold down two full-time jobs of managing a balance between love and discipline. We need to hear the cries of those kids who have grown up knowing Jesus Christ only as a swear word. We need to hear the silent cry of the couple who's forgotten how to smile or laugh together. That kind of hearing takes compassion. God, make us compassionate. And like Peter and John, we need discernment. Discernment to recognize the very real needs behind the cries that come to our ears. And it's not just the obvious needs that I've already mentioned. There are hurting people who desperately need a sense of dignity. Assurance of their own personal worth. They need a reason to hope, or they need friendship, or they need to have a sense of direction in their lives. They need to know that they're forgiven. 
Those sorts of needs run deep. And they can be very easily overlooked. And yet it's ours to see those needs. And that takes discernment. God, make us discerning in that way. And then like Peter and John, we need integrity. We need to be able to command the serious attention of the culture around us. I like the way the New English Bible translates the beggar's response in verse 5. It says, expecting to get a gift from them, the man was all attention. <laughs> he was just all ears. He was all attention. When the church addresses the world today, saying, in effect, look at us, <laughs> the way Peter said to that beggar. I sometimes wonder if the world, like that man, is all attention or, uh, or does it even care what we have to say? We can make pronouncements, and we often do, on all sorts of issues, but if the world responds with indifference, I think we'd better ask ourselves the question, is that so? Because they cannot see the consistency between the way we live and the way we talk. To command attention like that takes integrity. God, give us that integrity. And like Peter and John, we need boldness to offer he people help in Jesus' name. Let me speak candidly. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, and I know I'm part of the choir, but live with it. There are plenty of public service groups out there that do a great job of helping people in need. But there is only one that serves in the name of Jesus Christ, and that's the church. The church in all, it, for all its forms exists to serve others. But we're obligated to tell people that the reason why we serve isn't because we're generous or that we're philanthropic or even because it makes it, us feel good. The reason we love and serve others is because we know how much God loves and serves us and we can't keep anything that good to ourselves. Look, if you and I are only here to do good deeds, then we might as well just change our charter to Westminster Rotary Club. Come on, we're nice people, most of us, most of us. We are. We're nice people. We generally don't find it all that difficult to do a whole lot of good. It's just that some of us find it difficult to do good in Jesus' name. That kind of service takes boldness. God, make us bold. And one more thing. Like Peter and John, we need, we need generous hearts. You can't extend God's grace in Jesus' name to those who need it unless you couple that offer with your own resources that God's grace might really begin to take hold in that person's life. I mean, think about it. You can tell somebody about God being a forgiving father, right? But that truth is far more likely to become real for that person the moment you begin to be a, a forgiving friend. The point at which people begin to really understand God's prodigal love for us is when you love them at the very time they are being singularly unlovable. You can tell people about God's generosity, but that promise begins to ring true for them when from the heart you begin to share with them what you have. That's when miracles begin to happen. Peter had to extend his hand to make the connection with that man just as true of you and me. You and I need to extend our hand in that way. God, make us generous. Okay? Doing the work that God has assigned us as His church 
is going to take compassion and discernment and integrity and boldness and generosity. And I'll confess that those qualities do not always come full tilt, naturally and easily to me. I need God's help. So do you. So let's pray. God, stir up our compassion. Just a, a rudimentary sensitivity to those in need around us. God, please. And give us discernment, not only to see the need, but to see the need beneath the need. To see the hurting soul just beneath the surface, the rough exterior. To see what their hearts cry out for. God, make us discerning. And grow our integrity, God. Don't let us do stuff. without it being tagged to what we say, to what we confess. Let our words and our deeds be of one piece. And God, I pray you make us bold to do what we do, not just because we have to do it, but because you love us and love those whom we are called to serve. Make us bold to make it clear why we do what we do when we serve. Make us bold. And God, move our hearts to be generous, to companion with you to do the work of ministry. And along the way, pull off a few really spiffy miracles here and there. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray together to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know we'd get the Lord's Prayer in there somewhere. I just allow me a couple of brief observations before we, uh, before we quit. I want you to notice the man's response in verse 8. Uh, it, I mean, it's priceless. Luke says that uh, the man leapt to his feet and began to walk. Okay, that's fine. But, the, <laughs> but the, the, then he says he started jumping around. And he's prancing and praising God at the same time. Picture that. A grown man, 40-year-old man, dancing around, jumping. <laughs> to me, that response is perfectly in keeping with, the, with his healing. It reminds us that praise should always be appropriate to the miracle. And every time I, I read this story, I can't help but think of Amal and the Night Visitors. You know the, the opera, Menotti's opera? And how the little boy Amal goes to visit the Christ child and he wants to give him a gift, but he doesn't have any. The only thing he has to give the Christ child is his crutch. So he gives the Christ child his crutch and bam, Amal is healed. And what does he do? He starts dancing around. What else, what else could he be doing? I mean, his response is absolutely appropriate to the healing, to the miracle. And what's his mother's response? Oh, Amal, be careful. Don't hurt yourself. And what, what do you expect a mother to say? But the best response of all in, the, in, that, in that opera, the best response of all comes from the Magi. The three kings turn to the mother and say, Oh, good woman, you must not be afraid, for he is loved by the Son of God. That is a reasoned theological assessment of the situation. Our praise should be appropriate in a response to the miracle. And then one last note on verses 9 and 10. When all the people saw him, Luke says, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate. The crowd was amazed, he says. But they weren't amazed because they saw a supernatural phenomenon. 
they were amazed because they had witnessed an ordinary crippled man transformed by the grace of God into an ordinary healthy man. <laughs> you know, the miracles of God's grace don't need to be all that spectacular. The truth is that there are miracles happening all around us all the time. As we give ourselves to the Lord with abandon, our eyes are going to be opened to those daily miracles, and we too, like those folks, are going to be amazed. God, let it be so. Amen. Amen.